Today is May 8th. I got it right this time. Yeah, and you're listening to Human Factors Cast, episode 41. We're covering this week's stories, including robots that help us do our everyday astronaut jobs, some interesting news on the way we process language, no arrival spoilers here, as well as an entirely new way to interact with our mundane objects. Give Human Factors Cast your full app permissions, because Human Factors Cast starts right now. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome. Joined today, as always, well, it's not as always, sometimes you're not here, but most of the time you're here, it's Mr. Blake Arnstorf. When the power's on, I'm here. What's up, everybody? How are you? <laughs> there you go. I'm good, Blake. How are you, buddy? Oh, I'm doing well, and I'm super proud of you because today you said the date correctly. I did say the date correctly. Yeah, no, last week. <laughs> Dude, you know, like you, you get up there, and uh, you know, sometimes you have these brain farts, and last week I said it's March 1st, and it was May 1st, and uh, you know, I'm just losing track of time. Maybe I should learn a new language. And oh, well, maybe you should. You might think about time a little <laughs> differently, right? That was a yeah. That was a good uh, good segue, uh, I think. But we're not going to talk about that yet. Um, how are you, man? How was your last week? I am doing pretty good. I was lucky enough last week because you know I submitted under every email account I have. I got into the beta test for Quake Champions, oh, okay. and although they they like won't let you do any kind of like beta recordings, it's been really fun to play. So, what is Quake Champions? So Quake Champions is just like a, it's another addition to the Quake, like, set of games that have been out. So for anybody that doesn't know, it's just, it's kind of your typical first person shooter. Feels a lot like Doom, uh, except for this is on a much, (laughs) much more upgraded engine. Uh, But it's just all pretty much TDM, like Team Deathmatch, first person shooter stuff. It's, but the graphics and the gameplay are a lot of fun. And I haven't played like a first person shooter on a laptop in a long time and this has been a lot of fun and easy to learn. So, what makes what I don't know, does this does this feel better than any traditional first person shooter or is it just like another one that just feels good for some reason? Can you like put a pinpoint on what feels good about this? Yeah, so what feels good about it is there is some weird mechanics usually to playing on a laptop for me. I know like a lot of people you can just plug into your controller nowadays and they've made it much easier, but the mapping of the keys to like where your hand typically goes just sitting kind of in the ASD area plus just having a mouse. They made it really easy to pick up quickly. Um, And it seems like from the beta, and I'm hoping this is good news for what's coming, that the matchmaking is quick and you don't have a lot of wait time between matches or hopping in on servers. So I think that's probably my favorite part because I I don't know if you know, but a lot of people know I've played a lot of Call of Duty and the server madness trying to get in and out is insane so i think that was my favorite part just quick matches back to back a lot of fun a lot of goofy weapons that kind of stuff well that's good i'm glad you're enjoying it man and uh hopefully you can keep us posted whenever uh that that uh nda lifts and uh you can let us in on a little bit more there's another thing that happened this week or or maybe it was a couple weeks ago i don't know but we were we uh our attention was called to it this week we got some listener feedback right Yes, we did. And, you know, (laughs) here at the show, we always have been trying to get more engagement, whether it's through reviews or Twitter or through Facebook, whatever social media you seem to like. But we finally have gotten some good feedback actually from, and I'm pretty sure this is the same across a lot of different social media, but at Tiff Nay K actually told us about that our titles themselves are not descriptive of the content that we're talking about. And Nick, you and I talked a little bit about this earlier in Slack that we essentially agree. Like there is definitely an element of those titles that is much more <laughs> of creative and fun than descriptive of what, what's actually in the episode. Right, right. I mean, so when we changed formats, we kind of went to this whole uh, we're, we're taking on the news aspect of it. Uh, and, and we kind of were just going, going to have fun with our titles. But, uh, you know, you do bring up a good point, Tiff K, uh, in that. That, uh, you know, if you're going back through, you can't really tell what the episode is about. So in honor of you, we are 
uh, changing our titles uh, to be more representative of what we're talking about in the show. So now uh, our titles are now 100% more user friendly. Check. You can go ahead and Very edit that. True. <laughs> you can go ahead and edit that review. <laughs> addressed and one thing to the uh at tiffany k mentions in her review which i would love to hear more from her about really what was going on with our titles there was a hard time but the other thing is she mentioned some one to see more hf topics and as always any listeners and especially tiffany k if you have specific topics you want to hear about or have us talk about please let us know we'd love to try and cover them or see if we can center some news stories around them that we can kind of pick up and down about yeah, tweet us, Facebook, LinkedIn. We're all over the place. You know where to find us. Uh, anyway, let's. Are, are we ready to move on to the news? I don't know, Nick. Are you prepared? There's I, a lot of robots in this one. There's, ah, there's a couple robots. All right, let's let's move on to the news. This is the part of the show all about human factors news. This could be anything from your favorite artificial intelligence, virtual reality, automation, medical, transfer, whatever it is. <laughs> you name it. As long as it has to do with the field of human factors and its subsidiary applications of its fair game. Blake, what do we have up first? All right, so up first we have Astrobee, which is a semi-autonomous cubic bot outfitted with 12 thrusters spitting blasts of air that will soon head to the ISS, or International Space Station, where the bot will float around assisting astronauts in a range of tasks. Most of the time, an operator will control the robot to make sure it's getting along with the crew, but Astro B can also putter about on its own and do its own things. The robot uses an array of sensors to navigate the station and will function as a scientific workhorse for researchers. Now, Nick, I don't know if you checked out this video or not, but this thing looks awesome where they were testing it at NASA. Oh, yeah, yeah. This this is going to be amazing for the astronauts because we did a whole episode on uh, the human factors of space exploration, right? And, you know, they, they have a lot of issues uh, in, the ter- in terms of human factors up there on the ISS. And so, you know, just having one more thing to help them sort of navigate the environment and help them uh, get the tools they need at the right time they need – uh and to provide assistance basically it it's it's going to be really helpful for them yeah and what was interesting is like of course this robot's being pitched to be used inside of the ISS at first like this it'll be basically a beta test of putting it up there seeing it how how it interacts with the different astronauts, what it can do on its own, how helpful it is but they actually had hopes for it in the article that someday it'll actually be able to fly outside of the air outside of the spaceship and maybe do repairs or any kind of research or constants that researchers would need um so i don't know there's a lot of high hopes for this astro b yeah i mean you know the article mentions that the iss is only planned to operate through 2024 but uh the advances in uh human robot interaction at least will last far beyond that i think this is that first step. I mean, we, we're always talking about how humans and robots uh, are meant to get along, at least, in our ever-changing uh, workplace. You know, the more automation that takes over, the more we have to adapt to that automation. And that's a great segue into the next story. What do we got up next, Blake? <laughs> Yeah, it really is. So everyone knows that robots are coming and we should probably get ready and figure out how we can all coexist together. And that's the mission of Veo Robotics, which is working on a system that gives robots spatial awareness of every object and obstacle under reach from debris to people and everything in between. The robots operate normally, except now it knows the exact location and size of everything in its field of view, thanks to four depth sensing cameras placed around the workspace. If a human or vehicle intrudes or a piece breaks or there's some other deviation from the norm, the robot can slow down or stop. The company is testing its prototypes and are looking at 2019 for full deployment. Now, just to give everybody out there a sense of what this is really talking about, think about robots in the heavy industry world, like those that put cars together. And I, I didn't. And Nick, I don't know if you knew this, but I certainly didn't. People can actually not be in the same vicinity as most of those robots. They actually operate within their own cages uh, and don't have the sensory systems to see if humans are in the way or if there's extra debris. Right. Well, these robots, uh, traditionally, at least on these car manufacturing uh, assembly lines, they are pre-programmed. So. You know, robot does X movement and then does another movement and then does another movement, and it's all very precisely calculated. 
in order to accomplish a task. And so what this article is saying is that this this company is uh, they're they're basically mapping this workspace and altering the robot's uh, behavior in order to uh, accommodate the human in this situation. So so now no longer does the robot um, do these pre-programmed moves. It is moving. It'll probably do. It'll do pre pre-programmed moves, and then uh, you know when a human comes in to interfere, um, it will then uh, act accordingly and not hit the human. So that's pretty cool, uh, especially because now humans don't need these special places for them. It's just one more step to humans and uh, robots working together. It's this is cool, man. Well, this one really blew me away because I remember being in grad school, taking a situation awareness class and reading an article about like this specific idea that the problem with a lot of robots trying to sense their entire um, environment is that like there was an early study done with MIT where they had this robot that could find specific objects. And in this case, it was cans that could throw them away in the trash can. But if too many objects intervene that it wasn't programmed to deal with the robot didn't know how to react and it would just continue down the path that it understood so watching this video and seeing these giant arms really react to just a person stepping within a specific spatial area was amazing to see and yeah. this is, it's only been a few years since i've even taken this class and this was a struggle so this is incredible yeah and i mean like i'm did you watch this video I did, yeah. Yeah, so they're basically putting together this uh, this refrigerator. And uh, just to to see the human and the robot work together in harmony to put this thing together is amazing to me. I'm just, ah, it's, it's so promising for the future of what we could possibly do with this. And that is awesome. It's too good. <laughs> too good, man. Do you have uh, so, shall we keep going? Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask if he had any other closing thoughts, so let's move on. All righty. So can you tell the difference between big band and boogie-woogie music? Well, an algorithm can. Product design and development from Cambridge Consultants says it's created a machine learning AI that can identify different musical styles better than humans. Cambridge Consultants says its algorithm could lead to more sophisticated methods of organizing and searching music databases, but it could also be an important advancement in the medical industry, too, by quickly evaluating a patient's health using sensor waveforms. In the future, all of our doctors are likely to be AI music snobs. Now, Nick, this was pretty awesome to me because I love music, but I am the worst at determining what genres things go into. I mean, yeah. So I am can't really say what project I'm working on, but I'm working on a project where we have to categorize things. And uh, this, to me, stood out like a sore thumb because I could really use something like this for the project that we're working on. And um, yeah, just the fact that they, they've trained this algorithm to detect better than humans uh, what category something goes in. And the fact that, yeah, they started with music because music is sexy. Music is how you hook uh, seed money and funding for the um, studies that go down the way. D you know, like, this is fun, but when they say that it can be uh, applied to the medical field and how we basically can categorize um, sort of symptoms and... Uh, wh what did the article say? It was like symptoms and, uh, and uh, potentially... Um, well, the part that was interesting to me about the medical was looking using sensor waveforms to help kind of diagnose what a patient's going through health wise. Oh yeah, that's and, what it was. And it it could be like it, the, I think the reason also too. I mean, you're right about the funding based off of music, but the reason this is so successful is there's so much data that can be combed through by AI that's related to music and giving it the characteristics oh, yeah. of each jo genre to make it easier. Um, and I, I could totally see that for health as well, but it, we would have to, I don't know, There's a, I'm not sure that we have enough data coming from these specific waveforms that could be related to a patient's health right off the bat. But I, I see the future implication. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, it depends on um, 
what sensor waveforms they're talking about because i mean if they're talking about like just a heart rate monitor that's that's pretty easy and if you can it's pretty easy to get that data and if you can sort of identify heart rate patterns that result in um it potentially <laughs> harmful situations for the patients then that yeah something like this is awesome i love this i love algorithms i love uh, uh th this whole computer science thing is like i'm starting to uh slowly slowly inch away from vr and slowly slowly inch into this because this is the future man when computers can do stuff uh that that's like on par with humans or better than humans in terms of uh an analysis that intrigues me because i still want a job <laughs> oh yeah for sure and and it's it's one of those things that it's like even in the medical field like trying to screen for cancer like it's ultimately going to make you a better physician but uh, it's taking it's, it's at the same time taking all the guesswork out of the problems that we have with those types of things but at the same time like we say, it's in a joking way, your doctor could end up being an, an AI itself. Right. Yeah. No, for sure. And uh, I'm, I'm. So let me just sidebar really quick because I was watching the news with my parents the other night, and it was just so frustrating. So my dad was switching between uh, Fox News and CNN, and you know, trying to get all the perspectives, and it was just so frustrating to me to watch because they're so biased in every way possible towards the people who fund them. And I was just like, wow, wouldn't it be great if an AI came in here and said, no, here are the facts, here's the real news, uh, nonpartisan, non-biased news, right? I, and a computer could do that so much better than humans can. Okay, so <laughs> we might get stuck down a rabbit hole. Let's so do it, let's do it. Me. Yeah, okay. So that makes sense, and I agree with you that it could be done, but... Like we've seen in recent stories in the in like the past three weeks, like with racist AIs for as an example, or mean Twitter bots, like it, it all depends on the information that the AI is constantly having to take in. And that means including it's gonna have to take in the views of Fox, the views of CNN, the views of uh like Sky News, places all around the world. So you may potentially get a much better rounded view, but you also run the risk of things we've seen in the past like you get just fake news if if that's happening in the data more often than not that's fair but what okay so you train that algorithm then to go to the source and evaluate what is opinion and what isn't and there's a way around it man i'm i'm arguing that there is totally a way around it and i would love to sit and watch uh, a computer generated news program where an AI tells me what's going on in the world that's completely bias free and I can just get a like you know a, a, an unbiased opinion from a computer that sorts these news stories according to algorithms rather than human bias. That would be amazing. And <laughs> anyway. I don't think it's impossible either. I think it's I think we we would see that at some point. I agree. I agree and and I'm uh uh I almost wish there was money for this because I would totally go after it. So uh, if any of our listeners have a heads up on that. All right. We've, we've gone way down this rabbit hole. Uh, let's, let's, uh, let's move on to the next AI ish story. <laughs> this was pretty interesting. So Amazon announced this week that it's integrating new features into Alexa. It seems like we've seen a lot of features going into Alexa recently, uh, but these allow developers of skills to make, it sa to make Alexa sound more expressive and human, Alexa now supports Speech Synthesis Markup Language, or SSML, which allows developers to control the tone, timing, and emotion of its voice. With this, upda with this update, Alexa will whisper, emphasize, and even bleep inappropriate words if the developer chooses. As Amazon says, these SM SSML features provide a more natural voice experience. Now, this article actually also came with a video, and it it's not explicitly about Alexa, but it compares the differences between, say, like Siri and Cortana and how the, the change in the natural, more, more natural voice experience kind of gives you, I don't know, a more personal feel when you're interacting with the AI. But yeah. what do you think about this, Nick? Would you want this on your Alexa? Well, so that always, that, well, I'm going to get it no matter what, but the, um, 
the comparison always goes back to what sounds more human and the fact that computers are social actors and it's that whole field that I need to go brush up on because it keeps coming up. But the fact that uh, the human factor side of this is that, you know, when we're interacting with computers, we don't we don't want it to seem like we're interacting with a computer. We want it to be as human as possible. So that way, um, you know, when we're in Whoa, 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 what is going on? Everything else though. Ha! One of the old uh one of the old advertisements got played there. And uh we're we're bringing this to you ad free. So that is a no go. Uh <laughs> <laughs> That was great. Um anyway, oh wow, it's still going. It's still going. Oh my gosh. This is amazing. All right. So anyway, what was I saying? I was saying something along the lines of the um we want, we really want our computers to sound That's more right. human and less robotic. Yes, we do. Because uh, then, if we can have them repeat back to us what we said, then we know they understood us. Uh, as well as, um, I don't know, there's so much stuff that goes into emotion that when a computer can produce it, I don't know, man. That's the future. That's the future. Like I said, we need to get a computers or social actors expert on the show to like talk to us about this stuff because that's that stuff's super interesting to me. And I just don't I don't have that knowledge to to comment on it. Oh yeah, I feel like I would have so many questions for anybody that's an expert in that field because I mean, I, I I would argue that I'd be almost afraid for the computer to have too much human natural language or feel too human because I I think there would be. For me, anyway, because I already argue with Siri as it is. I That's feel like fair. the arguments may get more heated if she seemed too much like a human. I don't know. No, that's fair. That's fair. I uh, I completely agree. Uh, there's there's the side of going over too much, but um, yeah, no, I, I I think this is cool because you know it's it's just one more step towards that that kind of idealized um, human computer interface where you are talking to Jarvis or you're talking to a uh, computer from Star Trek or you're talking to, you know, any of these um, personalized sort of uh, personal assistants. And I think that's what we all want. We all want a personal assistant because that makes us feel important. <laughs> oh, man. How I long to have Kit as my car. Oh, my One gosh. Yes. Uh, someday. All right. Let's get into the... Uh, the next story, I was going to spoil something, but let's not. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, keeping in the th- in the theme of language, uh, so language is such, has such a powerful effect, it can even influence the way in which we experience time, according to a new study. What? Linguists have dis- – yeah, I know, right? This is, this is pretty, pretty intense. So linguists have discovered that people who speak two languages fluently think about time differently depending on the language context in which they are estimating the duration of events. The finding published by American Psychological Association reports the first evidence of cognitive flexibility in people who speak two languages. Now, Nick, it is awesome that already that people are bilingual or speak multiple languages, but for them to like experience time potentially different is mind-blowing. Okay, bueno. Oh my gosh, this is so cool. So... Uh, e, uh, uh, I'm so like I want to talk about something and I'm sure some of our listeners are just like screaming into the uh, the what are we coming out of a speaker <laughs> they're screaming into the speaker going talk about this thing and I want to talk about this thing so badly but talking about that thing would ruin that thing for the people who haven't experienced that thing yet. And the people who are yelling at my screen or at the speakers, I guess we're not on a screen. They know what I'm talking about. So this one's for you guys. This is cool. So I want to get into the methods of this because they, um, they talk a little bit about this in the article and, and I I think it's pretty solid. I want to get your opinions on this, Blake. So they basically, um, they they basically were asking how uh, they estimated their time, right? With uh, they they showed them containers, and uh, they they basically these containers were filling up slowly, and um, they basically asked the people how they perceived time as volume, right? Am I am I explaining this? Okay, like step yeah. In so I... here, let me hop in just for a second. Sure. So they used uh, bilingual speak were, speakers that were either that could speak both. I think it was, I do believe it was Spanish and Swedish, if I'm not cr- incorrect. 
Um, yes. But anyway, so they, they showed – they used two different specific words that were related to time for each one of those languages. And they also – prompted people with visuals one either a line being drawn or a container being filled like nick was ah, talking that's what about it was. yes yeah so there's two ways that i guess people typically describe time they describe it kind of in length so a let's say like it was a long break versus sometimes they describe it in volume so that was a large break so there's kind of like a difference in how people think about time or the way they describe it in their language Right, and they, and they saw, yeah, 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 you can keep going. Yeah, no, I was just going to say, they saw this was, like, very clear cut. They, the the people who, um, you know, the, the so, let's see here, bilinguals based their time on uh, how full the containers were, right? So those who spoke both languages. Um, but the, the uh, let's see, I'm trying to, help me out here. <laughs> Uh, but when given the Swedish prompt word, bilinguals suddenly switch their behavior. So, so these people who speak both languages were able to switch their mode of perceiving how time kind of flows, or um, at least passes, or estimates yeah, they would time. effectively describe it differently based on the representation they would give. They were given right, and the word that was used if they were like coinciding. Yeah, so that is really cool to me, and. Uh, I'm I'm going to watch some specific movies tonight. I, I said movies, <laughs> so I didn't ruin anything. I didn't... I, didn't, uh, I feel like I'm, I'm ruining it. I'm just not it. even going to try <laughs> I like, feel like I'm ruining a subtle it. hint. All right. Uh, to those of you screaming at the speakers, I know. I know. We know. All right. All right. Uh, before I give anything away, let's move on to the next one here. Okay. Okay. All right. So this one I think is really cool because there's definitely some merit to it, but we'll get into it. Okay, so a new study shows a way for research to get even more reach or have more people view it so that ideas and findings can travel further is by using Twitter. By boiling a research paper down into a Twitter-friendly graphic called a visual abstract, a new study shows that a Twitter user can nearly triple the number of people who click the link in the tweet and read the, their full paper. Now, Nick, I... I know you know this, maybe some of our listeners know this. I'm really big into health and fitness and specifically like metabolic uh, therapies. And one way I found that I can find a lot of great articles is through Twitter, doctors that tweet some of the research they're doing or different articles like that. And this has been like a wonderful place for me able to find and synthesize information. So I think this uh, this study is definitely tr definitely has some merit to it at least. So you're all over the Twitters. So this makes sense to me because we are very visual beings, right? We've made this sort of switch from consuming our media in a um, sort of serial fashion where we just read to we we prefer our uh, information be fed to us visually now. Um, because I mean, think about it, right? So like there's all this outrage on the Internet about X, Y, and Z. And what do all these things have in common? Well, there's usually a video uh, accompanying it and it's because we see this visually like if we were to read about it I don't think it would have the same effect likewise we've seen this rise in infographics and I feel like that's what these are essentially these these visual abstracts are essentially infographics that give a shorthand description about what the research found and it makes sense right Cause especially on Twitter you're only limited to what 160 characters or something like that yeah, I think it's 140. Yeah, even less. But but yeah, yeah. So if you can, the more compact you can make things into, uh, you know, a visual representation of what your findings are, then that makes sense to me. That makes sense that you know they would pick up on these things, and uh, ideas are much easier shared when you can visually represent them. And I mean, this goes back even to patents, man. Like if you describe a patent, it's hard to visualize what that patent is trying to accomplish, right? Whereas if you were to, um, if you were to draw out a picture of four wheels on a chassis and then, you know, put a steering wheel to it, you can understand that that's a car. But if I were to describe a car to you, uh, it's, it's a little different. I think this makes a ton of sense. Yeah. And I definitely think you're right in the visual aspect. It makes a lot more sense. The part that 
blew me away really was that sometimes I think that maybe a visual is just attracting you because it's an awesome visual. So maybe a retweeting, you'll like it, but you, maybe you don't even go read the article. Um, but what the study did show was that people actually were going and whether you, you, it's hard to say if they're actually reading it, whether they measured that or not, but they were actually going to the page where the article was located. So there was a better chance that they actually read the full thing, not just putting it out there and say, Oh, this is stuff that I like or whatever on Twitter. So yeah, great study. Enough. Good for science. Fair enough. I just want to take a minute to give a big thanks to our friends over at Wired, TechCrunch, and Gadget, Science Daily, Gizmodo, and The Next Web for bringing us all our stories this week. You can go check all of our social media for links to the original articles. And I, uh, I think that's a great place to uh, – let's go ahead and move on to the next story. Oh, yeah. So – now we're switching to cars. So Nissan has released details of a new prototype it designed to help drivers keep their mind on the super dangerous and highly complicated task of driving. The Nissan Signal Shield is an, in, is an arrest compartment that doubles as a Faraday cage, blocking all wireless signals to your phone when you shut the lid. The prototype reveal has come as automakers, regulators, device, and mobile software makers alike are all trying to figure out creative solutions to the growing problem of distracted driving. Now, Nick, you and I live in California, and I know you see it as much as I do. This is a real problem with people playing with their phones while they're driving. It really is. Quick uh, administrative note. That's not a rest compartment. That's a typo, so that's supposed to be armrest. So... I knew it. I, you oh, should have went man. with it, man. That's okay. I even watched the video. Was like, what is this arrest compartment about? <laughs> it's okay. Oh man, it's okay. It's but yes, okay. This, yeah, this goes in your arm rest, or it's like an arm rush replacement in this specific Nissan model, right? Well, yeah, it's a Faraday cage. Basically, is like something that s- shuts out all signals, right? So ideally, you put something in the Faraday cage, and it's like completely isolated, so no signals get in. Um, I, I believe it was in Lost at one point. Like, this is a this is a thing that you know y- you use in places that you don't want signals getting in. And so, you know, the Nissan has basically built a Faraday cage in their armrest, and uh, you know the the human puts their phone in there. The, look, man, this is a good idea. It's it's a good thought. That's my that's my initial reaction. It's a good good try, good try, Nissan. But I mean, look, this still doesn't this still doesn't tackle the problem of like willpower, right? Like humans are still going to want to use their phone. What's going to stop somebody from reaching over to their compartment and opening it up and grabbing their phone um, just to check something? Like the solution to me would be to lock the car unless uh, unless a phone was placed in there, and you couldn't open it up while operating the vehicle. That would be the ultimate solution, I think. Um, at least from this perspective, from a Faraday cage perspective. I think there are plenty of other solutions to this problem, but it just goes to show how real of a problem it is that, you know, they're trying to think outside the box with how to tackle it. Yeah, and I mean, this is this is a pretty good step in the right direction because, I mean, although, yeah, the willpower problem is always just going to be there for us, but now you've you've had to open a box basically put it in there close the box and it's not as easy to get to as like say where i keep mine which is like the side holder on my door um so it makes it a little inaccessible and it has the benefit of basically you're not having to fool with the phone to turn on airplane mode or put on one of those like i'm driving apps or anything like that so it is it's a step in the right direction, but I agree with you that the willpower thing is the biggest deal. Like you, you almost just as a human or as a person, however you want to phrase it, you have to make up your mind that when you get in your car, like if you're if you're gonna listen to music, if you're gonna listen to a podcast, cool, set that up before you even put it in park and don't mess with your phone no matter what happens until you're either at the location you need to be at or you can like stop safely. I mean the the voice technology for these things isn't at the point where you can basically just tell it, like do everything through voice and never have to interact with your phone. And plus that's still distracting. So this is, this is a great step for this specific car, but I agree with you. I don't think it ultimately solves the problem. Yeah. I mean, nice try. Uh, but let's keep trying because you know, like they have, they have stuff for, uh, for drunk drivers, right? They have the, the breathalyzer so that the car won't even start unless you blow, under the legal limit 
uh, why can't you build that sort of technology in with the phone? The car won't start unless your phone is in there and the thing is shut. I th- and Nick, before we like jump too much further, I have a question for you about this article because I had a specific like type of feeling about feedback they gave for solving this problem. And I wanted to get your take on it. And what they were saying is ultimately what really needs to happen is, is automation in cars just needs to ramp up to a point where you don't have to worry about this. How do you feel about that? Oh, I think that's a slippery slope, man. I think that's so dangerous because to me what that sounds like is, you know what, let's just make it okay for humans to use their phone while they're driving and the automation will take over when that does happen. That's what it sounds like to me, and that sounds dangerous. Yeah, I I agree with you. It sounds like to me the user never getting back in the loop if that's the case. That's the ultimate problem is that the human needs to be aware of what's going on around them and any distractions take away from that. So, all right, let's move on to the next one. This is like human factors gold right here. Oh, yes. Okay, so researchers at Carnegie Mellon University have created a new way to turn almost any surface into a touchpad with with a little conductive spray paint. The system called Electric uses a technique called electric field tomography. And this was created by a PH student, Yang Zhang. Electric uses small electrodes attached to the edges of a painted surface, and it can turn wood, plastic, drywall, and even jello and play-doh into a sensitive surf- a touch-sensitive surface. They've successfully added touch sensitivity with positional controls to toys, guitars, and walls. And Zhang will show off this technology at the Conference of Human Factors in Computing System systems in denver now just for listeners of the show i really encourage you to go check out this article's video because from when i read the article without seeing an Im- like imagery of this i really couldn't get the point or the application um and it really it demonstrates it really well and even like shows how simple it is to do some of this stuff right yeah this guy so uh this was actually developed with um one of the uh, researchers on this pro- project is Chris Harrison, and I don't normally plug people's research on the show. I just, I don't, this is not the platform to do it for me, but seriously, Chris Harrison is like pretty, pretty on top of things when it comes to research, and he's been a career that I've uh, enjoyed to follow, So, and he has his own website with uh, some of his articles and whatnot, but it's all about human-computer interaction, and this is just one, this is like the next step, man. This is, I would almost argue that this is almost as big of a deal as capacitive touchscreens were when they put them on the phone. I think you're right, man. And th- to me, like a lot of people talk about smart homes and like your the internet of things coming into your house. I feel like this is really a way for that to happen when you're able to interact with a lot of different surfaces and even give them specific functions within your home. Right, like imagine just painting this stuff on a wall and being able to like, yeah, uh, do commands based on different areas of that thing. Like, it's just a, this is, ah, I'm watching the video again as we're talking about this, and it's just amazing to me that, you know, they can do this on anything. They can literally turn any piece of technology into a a touchscreen. Like anything. Yeah. I don't know. It blew me away with the guitar, man, because I'm I'm really like big into guitar effects and pedals and all that kind of stuff. And you could basically use this as your own effects pedal, but you're now touching your guitar to modulate things on and off. Right. It it was it was incredible. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. This thing. This. I can't stress enough. I really feel like this is the next big sort of revolution and. Uh, you know, as soon as this technology becomes widely available, it's going to be over everything. You're going to be touching the back of your phone with this thing. And I mean, they already have some sort of um, technology that if you touch the back of your phone, right? But this is going to be the new thing to where you're interacting with multi- multiple dimensions with the same object, right? Um, you're going to have those those objects that are just like the everyday things, um, like a pen or something. And then you press a button and it, I don't know. It like saves your stuff to the cloud. I don't know. It's just, it's, it's so cool to me. It is so cool to me. And if any of our listeners are going to the human factors and computing sense systems uh, conference, 
please, please, please let us know. Uh, we aren't actually able to make that one, but uh, this is one that we will be keeping our eye on closely. Uh, do do tweet at us, though. Like, if you see this out there and, and see it in person, tweet at us and, and send a picture. This is cool stuff. Seriously awesome. All right. Let's, so up next, yeah. we've got a, a pretty calamitous leak in India. So there's been a series of potentially calamitous leaks in India that leave as many as 130 million people at risk for fraud or worse after caches of biometric and other personal data become accessible online. The Adhar system is an ambitious program aimed at assigning assigning unique identity numbers, not only to Indian citizens, but everyone who resides and works in the country. It is the largest program of its kind in the world, and last month, a central government database containing thousands of Adhar numbers, as well as dates of birth, addresses, and tax IDs, were reportedly leaked, exposing thousands of Indian residents to potential abuse. So roughly hundred between 130 and 135 million Adhar numbers have now been exposed in this most recent leak. How the Indian government will address its apparently inadequate security controls before fraud overwhelms the system remains unknown. Now, this article was really, I guess, kind of disheartening because it, it seems like the security problem is super hard to deal with because from and this is a super high level my trying to understand what's going on but it seems like there's multiple databases that are interacting mm-hmm. to hold a lot of this information and build these adhar system numbers so yeah. trying to control it seems like a really tough task for whoever is in charge of their security protocols yeah, this is a big deal, uh, and I think, you know, uh, here in the states, we've all heard about, you know, the Google the Google Drive phishing attempt, which we'll talk about next. But this one to me is more scary. This one to me, they're getting biometric data. That is scary. First off. And and secondly, the fact that that biometric data links to all this other data about you that they have to basically collect uh, by law. That's just this is this goes back to my prediction earlier this year. I don't know if this one's it, but we're gonna have basically a nine eleven of cyber attacks. Uh, this one this one's close. I feel like this one's close. I mean, the scale is huge, and like those specific biometric pieces that are collected are your fingerprints and then your iris scans. And I mean, we've already gone through how you can you can potentially fake uh, fingerprints easily for like phone access, and that might have reaching implications for like credit cards. But think about your iris scan being out and about tied to so much of your like <sighs> personal data from your date of birth to your i your address. Like this is. This is scary, and it's at such a volume that how do you really come back from it and put security things in place? Like, I'm, I'm not versed enough in cybersecurity to even have good commentary about this one. I'm not either, and, you know, I think that's that's part of the problem, too. I think, um, you know, hopefully the next generation will grow up knowing a lot more about cybersecurity. I mean, we know to best practices to install our ad blocker or to not click on Google fishy links, but... Honestly, something like this, how do you even prepare for? I, I mean, the Human Factors and Ergonomics Society even knows this is a big deal and it's a big problem that we're trying to address now. Like, they, there was a whole call for cybersecurity. And I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but there's like a even a Human Factors Award out there right now for uh, research on cybersecurity. Like, we know it's a huge issue. And it's something that we are all working very hard to try to combat. I mean, something like this just brings it to light. Like, yes, this is a necessity. Yes, we need to buckle down and uh, and and figure this out. Yeah, and I mean, it's it's interesting because like it's it's not just 
like a personal thing, like you're losing a lot of personal information. I mean, even for militaries, this is almost a, a new style of warfare, like having to figure out how to deal with cybersecurity attacks. And it's, I don't know, there's such far reaching and scary implications of it. And I mean, trying to adapt like human factors or user experience to cybersecurity protocols, like it's, it's a whole new world to think about that used to be only kind of broached by people that were very technically savvy, but now it has to like open up to a larger community to source how to deal with these kinds of issues. Yeah, for sure. And actually, you know, I'm, I don't like, uh, like I said, I don't like plugging things that, uh, that are out there, but, but this one I'm going to plug because the, the, like I said, the human factors and ergonomics society are putting out a prize, uh, for human factors and ergonomics research on cybersecurity. They're basically looking for articles that describe research pertaining to the human factors and ergonomics issues within cybersecurity. Um, so uh, that's like protection of the computer and information systems and their infrastructure, uh, which encompasses hardware, software, and data. And this prize, it's a, it's ten thousand dollars cash award for the publication and publication of the winning paper um, in Human Factors. And uh, you know, submissions open today. And our run through Friday, June second. Uh, you can go to the Human Factors and Ergonomics uh, website for more information on that. I, I, it's just one of those big deal issues that, like, we really gotta figure this out, man. Like, yeah, and I mean, if, if you want to, the ne- I mean, the next story is another like illumination of kind yeah. of the problems with cybersecurity and this one has to do with a, a big player as well and i mean Jump it's, into not, it. let's it's do not it. a, it's not a country but it's google um so well, let's let's jump into it. So yeah. a new Google Doc phishing scam happened last week and spread like wildfire. Actually shout out to you Nick for throwing this in our Slack feed so quickly because i might have been subject to this looking at it. Uh but anyway, so the scam actually asked you to select an account and provide an app called Google Docs with account permissions. As soon as you click the allow button, this malicious app now has permission to read your emails and email all of your contacts. As soon as it has access, it spreads the worm to pretty much everyone you've ever emailed. Google says they have specific says this specific specific attack should be blocked now and they're working on preventing similar attacks moving forward. Now, this, this is nuts just because it looks so much like something Google would send to you. And if you happen to have a friend with a specific name that it used, I would easily fall for it. Right. I mean, we do all of our show notes on uh, Google Docs. And, you know, if, if I were to send you something, you would click on it without a doubt and uh, or without a second. Yeah, I know. Thought. Right. It's like if it said Nick, I would have been doomed. Yeah. Right. Uh, this. So I. Yeah. I actually did throw this in Slack as soon as I saw it. And uh, we distribute our stories throughout the day. And this one definitely moved up in the queue because I didn't want our listeners to. uh, Those of us who follow us on social media knew about this right away. Um, So (laughs) see that little tease I did there. Uh, So I wanted them to know uh, that not to do this. But yeah, this is one of the this is another one of those cases where it's just like, how did Google Docs allow an app called google docs to do this like you would think that they would not allow another app to name themselves after the thing that they're doing like i don't know like yeah and you know it makes me think that there's more sophisticated um like programming for the specific phishing hack or worm in play because i'm sure that they wouldn't let that happen and even the the article from TechCrunch, it seemed quite confused that that there was a Google Docs that wasn't actually the real Google Docs. So right. it makes me think that whoever put this together um, knew their P's and Q's about putting malicious wear out there. Yeah, for sure. I mean, so, so lesson of the day, uh, delete your computer, um, but don't delete your phone because Human Factors Cast, you can get us there at least and uh follow us on social media right that's that's the of message course. of the day yeah there you go yeah <laughs> so so that's that's the lesson <laughs> for the day <laughs> yeah you follow Shameless us on social media factors <laughs> yeah we're all yeah for all the news stories uh and and topics and stuff you can social media we're on linkedin 
go follow us. That's a great way to keep in touch with us um, professionally. We just started that a couple days ago, so please go ahead and follow us. Head on over to the Human Factors Cast Facebook page. Face, Facebook. It's it's like 7 o'clock on a Monday night, guys. I'm sorry. Uh, let's see here. Comment on our SoundCloud. Reach us at H Factors Podcast on Twitter. Or send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. If you're still listening, we have you for life. It doesn't matter. All right. Leave- <laughs> so it doesn't matter if I mess this up, right? Leave us a voicemail at 901-646-1432. That's 901-646-1HFC. Uh, if we like what you say, we'll say it on the show. We'll play it on the show. We'll do all that fun stuff. You can also support our Patreon at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. We bring these shows to you ad-free because we love you. And uh, ads suck when you're listening to podcasts. Be sure to like Subscribe, review us on Apple Podcasts, the Google Play Store, Stitcher, or whatever your favorite podcast directory is. I want to thank Mr. Blake Arnsdorf for being on the show today. Where can our listeners find you? <laughs> it is always a pleasure, Nick. Happy Monday, everybody. And you can always <laughs> find me on Twitter at Don't Panic UX. Uh, I need to Don't Panic because it's a Monday. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning into Human Factors Cast. Until next time. It depends. It depends. Don't panic, guys. It depends. It depends on cybersecurity and all that stuff. Nissan. It depends on Google phishing. Yeah. What what happens if you put cybersecurity in a Faraday cage? And then you try and fish for it with a Google rod? <laughs>